Thank you very much to all the sponsors. It's always a pleasure to come to Vancouver. It's a beautiful city. You, you really don't know probably what you've got here. It's very special. So I've been coming here since 1983. And uh, whenever I come here, I try and walk around False Creek and around Yaletown and get on the Sky Train and go and walk around Joyce Collingwood and Edmonds and New Westminster and now uh, Metro Town and, and others. And it's always a joy to, to come here and see the progress and the changes. My Anthony said uh, my work embraces a period of about 35 years and essentially what we've done over that 35 years is, is track the, um, the growth of an empire, that of the automobile, and we've seen the peak of its power. And now, uh, like all good trilogies, we're, we're, in a, we're in a decline phase. And so I, I believe we are in a decline phase. It's, uh, it's still yet to be borne out by history, but we believe we've assembled a lot of evidence to, to show that. So I'm going to give you a bit of a, an, in, an insight into, uh, into what we've been up to in the last couple of years. So what I'm quickly just going to give you is an, an outline. I'm going to give you, throughout the talk, an overview of comparative data on cities around the world, American cities, Canadian cities, Australian cities, European cities, and a couple of Asian cities, Hong Kong and Singapore. And in those slides, I'm going to highlight the five Canadian cities that are in the study, which is Vancouver, Calgary, Ottawa, Montreal and Toronto. And, and when I say cities, I'm talking about the metropolitan regions, not just the city at the heart of those regions. So those of you who are at the back probably will struggle to see some of the information on these slides because there's 45 cities and so, you know, to, to put them all on one slide, it's going to it's going to get a bit small. So there are a few seats down here, a few spare seats at the front. So if anybody is struggling, I, 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 I encourage you to come down. A couple of the, the things that we're going to look at, um, a few major changes uh, in urban transport in recent years, and that of, in the title, that of peak car use. Um, we're going to be looking at that both nationally and, and in cities. And something else that we've discovered, and that is that um, car use has, uh, de or, or GDP growth has decoupled from car use, so, so we'll explore that a little bit. That's an, it's an important um, event. And as we go along in terms of policy implications, what I've tried to do is to unify uh, the comments by talking about them in the context of automobile cities, transit cities, public transport cities, and walking cities, and how cities today are combinations of those three urban fabrics. They were created in different eras. The walking cities uh, date back even before public transport was invented where everybody had to walk um, to get anywhere within the city, so the cities had to be small. Then public transport came along and expanded the cities so they got bigger, um, but were still very uh, kind of compact along corridors and in nodes. And then the automobile allowed, public, uh, allowed transport to just explode in all directions. So what I'm going to be doing is just talking about how important it is to recognise and to respect and to, to understand those different urban fabrics that exist within any one city and how that might change the urban planning and the transport planning outcomes in a better way. And there'll be some brief conclusions along those lines. But before we go into, um, into some of that, I just need to give you a sense of, of the kind of approach that I've taken over the years, which is very data orientated. And I'm not going to um, be able to show all the, the information that we've collected, but just to give you a sense of, of the breadth of what we do. Um, this is the Millennium Cities database here on the right hand side. This was a, the study from hell in 2001. It took three years to do it. It's 100 cities around the world, every language group, every time zone. And we collected a lot of data. We collected urban form factors like density and, and centralisation of the city, economic factors to do with gross domestic product of the metro areas, the, the cost of transport, of car transport, of public transport, 
we looked at private transport infrastructure factors, freeway systems, parking spaces, car and motorcycle ownership and so on. Public transport infrastructure, you know, what, what, how much uh, reserved public transport route is there in, in cities, that's a very important thing. Um, we looked at the performance of public and private transport in terms of the distances travelled, um, how fast public transport is compared to car speed, um, public transport service and use and non-motorised use, so there's a whole bunch of data on that. And I'm not going to be showing all of this, but this is just to give you a sense of where I come from in terms of analysing in detail metropolitan areas around the world. And this takes a lot of time. If you set out to study 50 cities and to, to assemble all this data, it's going to take you six to seven years. So, you know, by the time you've finished, the data that was current when you started is already six years old, and you can never you can never get off that treadmill because of the time that it takes to do this work. So these are the cities that um, we're going to be looking at tonight. So we've got four Australian capital cities, Perth, Melbourne, Brisbane and Sydney. And we've got the five Canadian cities that I just mentioned, the, the, the five uh, bigger ones. We've also done Edmonton in the recent past, but I haven't integrated it into the, into the work yet. We've got ten major American cities that are included in the trends, plus we've also done some work on Seattle, Portland and New Orleans more recently. So all of those cities, Atlanta, Chicago, Denver, Houston, Los Angeles, New York, Phoenix, they're all in this particular study. And then there's a lot of European cities. There's big, big European cities and there's small European cities, Berlin, Frankfurt, Hamburg, Munich, Stuttgart and so on. And we've recently completed Paris as well, so that's been integrated into the, to the data. And finally, Hong Kong and Singapore. So that's, that's just an overview of, of the cities that, uh, that we're going to be covering tonight. The data that I'm going to be showing you are in this book and more. I certainly won't be showing you all of the information in the book. It would take too long. Um, now probably the people at the back are not going to be able to see that, but I'll do my best to, to explain the main points. This is the metropolitan gross domestic product per capita of cities, and um, uh, people often say that transport is driven by wealth. Well, we don't believe that is the case. Um, we have a bunch of cities here ranging in, in metropolitan GDP from around 19,000 US dollars uh, up to 55,000 US dollars. And you can see Calgary is the most wealthy one at the moment, about 37,000. Vancouver is actually quite low, around the $30,000 mark. But you can see up here that in the rich cities like Bern and San Francisco, there's, there's a vast, they're both wealthy, but there's a vast difference in the kind of transport system that is operated in those cities. So. We find that the mixing, you know, Munich and Houston, very, very similar wealth, but absolutely different in terms of their transport system. So there's really not a lot of correlation between um, uh, GDP and transport systems. Vancouver's had an increase in GDP per capita of about 15% over that period. These data are 2006 data. That is the latest that I've been able to do, already nine years old. So there's a constant need to update these data. Um, and it, was, it had a modest increase over that 10 year period in the GDP per capita. And we'll talk about that um, as we go. Car ownership is a very, very important factor. And um, here we see that in the world, just in those 45 cities that we're talking about, there's a massive difference. Hong Kong has got 57 cars per 1,000 people. 57 per 1,000 people. <clears throat> New Orleans has got 968 per 1,000 people. So there's almost as many cars as there are people in New Orleans. Now, where do the Canadian cities sit? Well, we've got Calgary at 632. Not, no surprise. It's the, it's the biggest. Ottawa, 542. But Vancouver... 506. So 
there's quite a big difference in car ownership in Vancouver. In, this is the GVRD, the, or Metro Vancouver region, not the City of Vancouver. City of Vancouver would be even much lower. Um, Toronto, 485, and Montreal, 446. So there's a Canadian city that is way, way down in, in amongst the European cities in terms of the car ownership. So big, quite big differences. And then the trends, well, the, the graphs that I'm going to show you are the same in pattern. 1995, 2005, or 1996, 2006, the American cities, Australian, Canadian, European, and the two Asian cities averaged. You can see that car ownership is continuing to grow. So the American cities have gone up to 640 on average. Australian cities have exceeded them, 647. But the Canadian cities, 522. So there's quite a difference there. And the Canadian cities, on average, those five cities, had a slight decline uh, in car ownership over that period. The European cities, um, actually, there's not a huge difference between the European city car ownership and the Canadian. So we're talking 463 compared to 522. But the Asian cities, very, very low, averaging 78 cars per thousand people. But Car ownership is not the most important factor. What about car usage? Because that's what determines emissions, it's what determines energy consumption and so on. And what you find here is that there's huge differences. I mean, Atlanta here, 24,000 passenger kilometres per capita. Hong Kong, 930. 24,000 compared to 930. And there's a continuum and it's big differences. So the American cities are at the top end of the graph. And where do the Canadian cities come in? Well, not surprisingly, Cal Calgary is the first city to appear. But it's down here, 11,000 compared to the American cities up here around 16 or 17,000. Vancouver, just under 10,000, 9,900. Ottawa, 8,700. And then you get Montreal and Toronto down here with very, very much lower car usage. So the Canadian cities are quite, a, quite an interesting group of cities. There's diversity amongst them, but there's also a sense of unity in where they sit in a global sense, because when you see them averaged here, you see the American cities up here, 18,700 kilometres per capita. The Australian cities, 12,000. Canadian, 8,500. European 6,800 6, and the Asian cities just under 2,000. But what, what has been happening here is that you can see over that 10 year period, there hasn't been a huge increase in the car use per capita. So we're, we're beginning to see that car usage is not growing in these developed cities to the extent that it was in previous decades. So we can show that because we've been collecting these data right back to 1960. And so when you look at the percentage increase in car use in the decade of the 60s, 1960 to 1970, you've got a 42% increase. 1970 to 98, 1980, it went down to 26% increase. 23% increase in the next decade, 1995 to 2005, only an average increase of 5%. So one could say that this idea of there being a peak in car use has had quite a long gestation period. It's not, just, it's not something that's just suddenly appeared. It's something that has, um, at least in cities, um, had, a, had a period of, uh, of, of gestation. <clears throat> Now, if we look at the Australian cities, so the Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, Perth, Adelaide and Canberra, these are all on the graph here. And this is the, um, the car passenger kilometres per person per annum. And what you see is each, each of the cities grows until it gets to about 2004, 2005. And suddenly it starts falling. The car use per capita starts dropping. And it's an interesting phenomenon, and, and it's important um, to, to, to investigate. 
And it's happened in America. This is data from the, um, the US Department of Transportation. This is not on cities. This is the, the US as a country. And you can see they've set the 0% the line at 19, January 1971. And you can see how car use in terms of vehicle miles travelled has been going up and up and up and up. And then it gets to about June 2005 and it starts to fall away. Now this is before the global financial crisis. The global financial crisis is 2008. So you can't say that this is just a, um, a reflection of the global financial crisis because it had already set in. I believe that there's been a, a bit of a turnaround now in, in the, the VMT in the USA. But my view is it's probably a little bit like the stock market. You know, there's ups and downs, but the general tra trajectory is uh, is in, in, in an upwards trend, and I think in this case it will the general trajectory, trajectory will be in a downwards trend. Now there's a guy in Australia, in Canberra, who's done um, work on peak car use um, in, in countries all around the world. I think he's looked at 96 countries. And these are some of his graphs. So the red line is his model, what his model predicted, and his model um, is based on petrol prices, consumer prices and unemployment, basically. That's what drives the model. And you can see the black line is the real vehicle kilometres per person per year. So this is Australia. It gets up to here at about 2004, 2005, starts to fall away. Here's Canada. Canada's uh, VMT per capita is... Has, has at least been plateauing until, what, around about 2008 or so. Britain doing the same thing. You can see the peak here. This is Denmark. France, Italy, Japan, very, very uh, marked in Japan. Norway, all flattening out. And New Zealand doing the same thing. Switzerland doing the same thing. So. There are, this is just a selection of his graphs. There are many, many countries that show this same basic phenomenon, that car use per capita is plateauing or decreasing. But not everywhere. Of course, there are many countries that are rapidly motorising. Turkey is one of them, for example. And according to his model, um, that will be the, the growth trend, bearing in mind that they're starting from a very much lower base level, right? So but it is increasing. I have some theories about how, uh, how realistic this, this trend really is. My view, and we, we explain it in the book, is that these cities in these countries are going to hit a wall sooner than predicted. And they too are going to have to turn around because the urban environments cannot sustain uh, or accommodate the, the, the levels of car use that are implied by that growth trajectory. Those cities in Turkey and in other parts of the world weren't designed for the automobile. You basically would have to demolish them and start again if you wanted to accommodate American or Australian or Canadian levels of car use. So I don't think it's going to happen, but the trajectory in, in many of them is still in that direction. This is an interesting piece of work that I found um, by a couple of American... Um, uh, researchers, and they had looked at the amount of vehicle miles that you have to travel to earn one dollar of GDP, of real GDP. So what, it, what, is your, what is your investment in terms of car travel uh, required to earn a buck? And um, you can see that from 1945 there was a, a pretty consistent increase in the amount of travel that was done by car, car to earn one dollar of real GDP. And then it got to this point here, about 95, and it started to fall away. So there's a decoupling that's occurring. So less, less car use is now being needed or ex ex experienced to earn that dollar of GDP. And that is, their, that is their prediction of what will happen out to 2030. There'll be a continual decline. Now what they did was they looked at this 
and how it varies in terms of different states and different cities. I'll just give you two examples from their work. This is California, and you can see the growth in GDP is pretty solid and consistent, but the growth in VMT has peaked and is parting company with the growth in GDP. The same in Washington State, same pattern in the graph. And then if you look at specific cities, so you go nationally, state and then city, and you see, for example, in Washington DC, GDP continues to go up, but VMT is plateauing. Portland, um, same thing, very strong growth in GDP, but only a modest growth in the VMT. And actually, this piece of work I did before I discovered that work. Um, so that work kind of confirmed this idea that I had to use our own data to work out how many um, car kilometres are driven to generate one real uh, unit of local currency. LCR in the graph means local currency, um, and it's, it's uh, in real terms. So what we see over the period from 1995 to 2005 there's been some very, very significant percentage declines in the amount of car travel to earn that real unit of GDP. And in the 42 cities that are represented there, only three increased in this factor, and one of them was Vancouver, um, unfortunately. The big, the big increase here was in Berlin. Um, what unifies those three cities, Frankfurt, interestingly, um, <laughs> uh, Vancouver and Berlin, is that all three experienced very, very small increases in GDP per capita. So if you have a, a small increase in car use and a small increase in GDP, then that factor can, can flip the other way. So, but generally speaking, you can say that uh, GDP or car use has decoupled from uh, GDP growth. I then asked, well, is it, is it the total passenger travel has declined or has it just shifted from cars to public transport? So I then looked at the same uh, analysis, but this time I included cars, motorcycles and public transport. And in this case, you can see that total motorised travel, total movement, the total amount that people are having to move around in the urban system to generate the wealth is declining. But there are seven cities in this case where it has increased. And in the case of Hong Kong, um, which is one of them here, um, the increase is mainly, uh, in, in fact, the increase is totally in public transport. In the other cities, it's a mixture of cars, motorcycles and public transport. But generally speaking, even you can say that um, total movement is also declining relative to wealth. So what are some of the factors behind this? Well. What we did was we did this very detailed analysis which is published in uh, the Journal of Transport and, 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 uh, and Land Use, which we, we looked at um, the, uh, how can you explain changes in car vehicle kilometres over the years from 1960 to the year 2000. And what we discovered is that the two primary variables that explain nearly 100% of the variance is the urban density of the city and the transit service level. So how much public transport service have you got for people to use and what is the density of the city? The other factors that we've been um, discovering in the work is that sprawl has reversed in many cities. So metropolitan densities are increasing there's um, an exponential link between car use and urban density, which I'm going to show you in a moment. So that's a very important factor in, in getting car use down. There's also a growth of a culture of urbanism. People are moving back into central city and inner city environments in search of a, a kind of an attractive live, work, play kind of environment rather than long car commutes in congested traffic. Um, a lot of people are wanting to to be closer to the things they need. Young people um, are getting fewer driver's licences and are driving less and they're preferring to spend their money on, on very good 
uh, mobile uh, communication devices and more central city living, and are using public transport. And I suspect that it's because if you are wanting to, to, to play with Facebook and play games on your mobile phone, you can't do that at the moment in a car, at least not safely. So a lot of younger people are actually preferring um, public transport. And that's occurring even in the really car-dependent suburbs of the western, western suburbs of Sydney. Young people are dramatically going down in uh, the numbers that are getting driver's licences. Public transport is growing rapidly. We, we're seeing double-digit annual growth in public transport usage, particularly in urban rail. And there's a thing called the transit leverage effect. So if you replace one, um, if, you, if you travel one passenger kilometre on public transport, you tend to be replacing between five and ten kilometres in a car because people who use public transport trip chain. So they go to work, but on the way to work they'll do some shopping or they'll pick up some dry cleaning or they'll go, they'll, they'll trip chain in making that one public transport trip. And that replaces a lot more car travel than a simple one-to-one -one relationship. So that's also very important. The price of fuel is having an effect. I think it's quite complicated and, and because of oil prices going up and down, it's very hard to tease out what that effect really is. But one of the most important things is that automobile cities have hit a travel time and distance wall. We, we call it in the book hitting the wall and, and we explain it in terms of there being simply too much traffic. And cities need to maintain an average daily travel time budget per person of about 65 to 70 minutes. And if the city becomes too saturated with traffic, it's impossible to maintain that daily travel time budget. <coughs> And the only way that, that the city can continue to function is that if it becomes a multi-centred, polycentric city where it's possible to use walking and bicycling and public transport and still maintain that 65 to 70 minutes of travel. Of course, many people don't travel that much and many people travel more, but the mean in cities is about 65 to 70 minutes. And so communities are now being built more around walking, cycling and public transport to meet the daily needs within a reasonable travel time budget. And finally, um, most of the countries that I showed you have got ageing populations and if you look at the data you see that people in their 70s, for example, drive about 50% as much as people who are 20 to 50 years old, so there's an ageing factor involved um, in it as well. Just exactly how much is, is, is causing what is open to question. So this density factor is, is one of the things that we've emphasised, that cities have turned around their, their post-war density decline and are now increasing density again. Now this is, this is a graph that some of you might be familiar with. This is actually per capita private transport energy use could be a, a surrogate for car travel against the urban density. And you can see that it's a very, very strong relationship. It's got an, an R squared value of about 0.86 or 0.87, so it's very, very strong. So in this part of the graph here, um, we have the automobile cities, basically cities that average at about less than 30 persons per hectare. Public transport cities around 30 to 100 persons per hectare and walking cities greater than about 100 persons per hectare. So these are, these are notional kind of densities. Now in practice, every city on that graph has got automobile parts, public transport parts and walking parts. But you can see that density, as the city gets denser, the amount of car use and the amount of energy use that has to be uh, used declines. So what we're saying in the book is that it's really, really fundamentally important for urban planners and transport planners to recognise and respect the fact that there are still walking environments and transit environments and the need to protect those and enhance them and not continue to ruin them 
with planning for the automobile as though one size fits all. And, and for decades, we've assumed that, that mainly we are planning um, for the car and its needs, and that, that has not helped our cities. So if you want to see it in graphic terms, you, you, you can sort of imagine a hypothetical city here with the central area, the old walking city in Europe. Some of those cities have still got the old medieval wall around them. Well, we're not like that here, but, but certainly the core of Vancouver is, is a walking kind of environment. It is, it is really a walking city in this part. And then you often have, uh, have urban fabric that was created by the tram system. Maybe the tram system is no longer there. Maybe it is. In Melbourne, it's still there. In San Francisco, parts of it are still there. And you've got the railway lines that go out, and maybe you have these rail-based urban villages, which are walking, walking cities like pearls on a string. But then in between, you've got all of this sprawling urban fabric, which is automobile-based. And, and you can see the differences in what they look like. There's a, the old centre of Bern. There's a new transit city uh, addition in, in Freiburg in Germany. And there's some fairly recent urban sprawl. So you can see the, the very different kinds of urban fabric. And if you look at the Sydney metropolitan area and you look at the annual vehicle kilometres per household, it's the core areas and the, the, the inner areas and the central areas that are very low in car usage. And then it gradually um, gets more as you go out into the middle suburbs. And then all around the, uh, the circumference of the metropolitan area are these very, very automobile dependent low density suburbs. So the, the question is, how, how do you then begin to um, to create more of the more sustainable kind of fabric. And we've got some, some guidelines in the book. Um, I've summarised them tremendously here. But um, if you want to, you know, to recognise and to respect walking city fabric, you don't put bloody great freeways through it and you don't widen roads and you don't make big car parks or multi-storey or surface. So there's, there's things you just don't do. So. What do, you, what do you do to preserve and enhance walking city fabric? Well, oh, it looks like we're running out of power here. I've got a message. Um, is there a power supply for this computer? We've, we've ju I've just got a message. You've got, a, you've got 7% power left. <laughs> While that's being work worked out, I'll just continue on. Maybe it's in the, in the bag, Terry. Um, so, obviously, if you want to protect and enhance Walking City, you need to provide more um, uh, walking infrastructure to cope with pedestrian flows. You don't want pedestrians to be squashed. You don't want to feel that, 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 they're, that they're being squeezed in. Don't widen the streets or insist on setbacks. Um, when, when, when redevelopment or development occurs. Particularly respect and value the potential of public spaces. These, these are the places where we relate to one another as human beings. This is a, the public realm of the city has to be honoured. Maximise the walking space and time. Allow people enough time to cross at pedestrian lights. Don't hurry them, don't harass them and hound them to get across quickly. Enable laneways, if cities got laneways, Vancouver's got a lot of laneways. Connect those up, make them active places. This is what's been happening in some cities in Finland. Um, encourage high density mixed use, promote housing diversity, include maybe car free housing, maybe decouple the cost of the dwelling from the cost of the parking lot so that people have a choice. Create housing diversity, minimise parking. If there is parking, keep it underground. Don't have one-way one streets with green waves for traffic, you know, parking that destroys pedestrian amenity and so on. Transit city. You know, if there's transit city fabric, and you've got a lot of that in Vancouver, you've got, you've got suburbs, inner suburbs that were created by the tram systems, these beautiful walkable linear streets with, with, with shops that, that are fronting onto the footpath. And at the moment, they're traffic sewers. They're just overwhelmed with traffic. How can, you, how can you then make those fabrics that were designed around public transport work better today? Well, you've got to make 
public transport the major mode. You've got to ensure that those corridors are well connected both along the corridor and connecting across also the different corridors. Encourage sufficiently dense and mixed, mixed land uses. Maintain a high environmental quality so that people are encouraged to get to the public transport and encouraged to walk and ride a bike. And minimise the auto city elements that are harmful to public transport, such as high capacity roads for cars. Why is it that cars have the complete right to all of our major arterials? Why? They, they're not the space efficient modes. The buses are the space efficient modes. They should be having priority. They move more people. These are the kinds of things that we, we, we've just assumed, you know, over a period of time that the automobile has kind of all the rights. Um, there needs to be more reserved rights away for public transport. There needs to be better, well, best practice in terms of the design of shelters, passenger information systems, maps, all of the, all of the tools that a transit rider or user needs to actually access the system. And you need, of course, to build up the densities along those, along those lines and keep parking to a minimum. So density, out of that you can see both in the walking and transit city, density is very, very important. And um, you can also see that, um, that on a continuum of density around the world, there's a huge range. Atlanta and Houston are less than 10 persons per hectare, metropolitan regions. Hong Kong is 336. Singapore is 98. The European cities are in the 40s to 50s per hectare. And the American cities are tending, and the Australian cities tend to be in that range of about 8 to 20 persons per hectare. Interestingly, the Canadian cities sit in this middle. They're, they're, they're not, as, not nearly as low density as the um, American or the Australian cities. And some of them even get into some of the lower density uh, metro areas like Copenhagen and Oslo, so similar densities to those. So there's a big range. And Vancouver has been creating these new transit and walking city fabrics along the SkyTrain line in the, in, in the West End, the Coal Harbour, um, you name it. There's, there's a whole range of areas within the Vancouver region that is actually um, about recreating those fabrics and joining them back together uh, in a better way. And as I've said, densities in metropolitan areas are on the up. You can see the American and the Australian cities. Canadian cities are basically kind of stabilised. The European cities essentially stabilised. The problem with European cities is that a lot of them are actually shrinking in population. They're not actually growing. So they're, they're declining in density because they're actually losing uh, people. Um, but but there is in Europe also a trend uh, back to central and inner areas. The Asian cities, even as dense as they are, have also been uh, continuing to increase in density. So we, we need to find more really good examples of how to increase density and make it green and livable and attractive and walkable. And I think for all the criticisms that different people have about False Creek, um, it is a beautiful uh, environment. I think it's, it's, it's an example of a situation where you could have had automobile city fabric. If that freeway system had gone through, a lot of that would be freeway interchange. But instead, you've actually created this quite vast area of um, walking city fabric. And that is part of the reason why Vancouver comes out so well in terms of livability indices. What about um, the centralisation of cities? You know, where are the jobs located? Are they in the centre? Are they in sub-centres? Or are they spread out across the landscape like salt and pepper so that you can only service them with cars? Well, this is the percentage of jobs that are located in the CBD of cities. And in Los Angeles, 3.5% of the metro jobs are in the LA CBD, that area with the tall buildings in the centre. Um, in Toronto, it's only 6%. Toronto is quite decentralised. 
But is it is it a bad thing in the case of Toronto or a lot of those jobs in other sub-centres that are linked together by public transport? To what extent um, are jobs still centralised but um, in smaller centres? Vancouver's got about 11%. Um, Montreal about 18% and Calgary is, is actually still very monocentric, still got 21% of its metropolitan jobs in the city centre. So this, this idea of centres is really important because obviously if you have a big centre like that, like the Melbourne Central Business District where a lot of the public transport is focused, people can use public transport. They don't need to use their cars, there isn't as much parking. But if you have this suburban fabric here, where it's just, you know, sprinkled out across the landscape, public transport usage is just about zero in those kind of environments. And so you've got to be able to then think, how can these environments be strategically improved um, by, by kind of acupuncture points, if you like, uh, TOD, uh, new, new rail lines and so on. Jobs have been declining in, in city centres. That's pretty consistent. They've all been, the CBDs have been going down in the percentage of jobs that they accommodate. But some of those, a lot of those CBDs are still growing in jobs. They're not losing jobs, but they're losing um, their, their uh, share of the jobs metropolitan wide. Whether or not that is a good thing or a bad thing really depends on whether you have decentralised concentration. Are those jobs locating in significant centres that people can get to on public transport? Such as you have um, uh, at least some examples in the Vancouver region. Freeways, what about freeways? Well, freeways are a symbol of how much we have uh, capitulated to the automobile. And it's very interesting when you measure what is the per capita supply of freeway systems around the world. And guess which city is now the leader? Calgary. <laughs> Calgary's got more freeways per capita than any of the cities that we've studied. Um, Denver is not far behind. But interestingly, cities like Helsinki and Bern in Switzerland have actually got a, a high freeway per capita, but they've got these fantastic public transport systems to go with it. Frankfurt is very high where, uh, where I live. Montreal is, is, um, is also very high. But uh, Toronto is, is modest by world standards and Vancouver is, is actually quite low. And that's the, that's the region, not the city of Vancouver. So cities need to minimise or to stop or even to pull down freeway systems. That sounds outrageous, doesn't it? Let's pull down a freeway. Fantastic. You can see why it's a good idea, if you possibly can, to strategically get rid of freeway infrastructure because it's god-awful ugly and it really ruins the public realm. Um, one cloverleaf junction, as this one in Calgary, which I photographed a few years ago, that occupies the entire medieval city of Salzburg. That is how big these things are. So this, this is a walking city. This is a complete city of, of time, gone, uh, time past that would be completely demolished if one freeway junction was built over it. So what has Seoul done? Seoul has, uh, in the 60s, developed a lot of um, automobile fabric in its beautiful, dense core area. It covered up a river, it built this surface road, it built an elevated freeway that looked like this, and they tore it down. It was carrying, at the time they tore it down, it was carrying 120,000 vehicles per day. And when they tore it down, two weeks later, the average speed of traffic in the city of Seoul had gone up by 1.2 kilometres an hour. Had gone up. Traffic was circulating more smoothly and at a higher speed without this. How did it happen? In simple terms, traffic behaves more like a gas than it does a liquid. Traffic engineers think of traffic as a liquid and if you, you take away the space or you block it, it's going to overflow, it's going to flood. But it doesn't because it, if you, it, it compresses. And this has been proven around the world time and time again. That's what they've got in Seoul now. That was all surface road and freeway. And now 
they have this beautiful walking environment, a green boulevard, ecological kind of place that uh, people can enjoy. Um, you see people, you know, like this, these, these, these guys here, having a business meeting. Some, sometimes you see men and women in their, in their office clothes come down, they take their shoes off, they sit on the rocks, they dangle their feet in the water and they have a business meeting. It's, uh, it's really quite something to see. What's been happening with freeways? Well, the American cities are pretty stable. Australian cities on a per capita basis have gone down a little bit, but the Canadian cities have gone up. That is mainly Calgary. <laughs> that is mainly <laughs> Calgary that has done that. Um, European cities have gone up a little bit, not much, and the Asian cities have essentially stabilised. So what's, what's the corollary of a freeway? What, what's the opposite? What's the public transport opposite of a freeway? The public transport opposite of a freeway is reserved public transport route. It's a rail line or a, or a reserved corridor down a major arterial road. And um, we've measured that. And you can see that some cities in the world, like Vienna and Oslo and Bern and Frankfurt, where I live, and Zurich, they have a massive amount of reserved public transport route, high quality, usable public transport routes. And the Canadian cities cut in here in around about the middle with Montreal, Toronto a fair way down, Vancouver looking a little bit sad, Calgary looking quite sad, and Ottawa looking bereft down here, the bottom here. Um, so there's, there's a fair bit more that can be done in, in Canada in terms of investing in, 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 in quality public transport route. Having said that, Canadian cities do marvellously well in terms of utilising what you've got, and I'm going to show you that in a minute. But um, here you see how important it is to, to reintroduce light rail or trams along streets, maybe on a grass track bed to reduce the noise and to to improve the environment here in Budapest as well, because that is another way of, of rejuvenating that transit fabric and, and, and helping to bring back the walking element into cities. And it's nice to show that actually this is increasing. This reserved public transport route per person has increased in the American cities, it is, has increased in the Canadian. It's dramatically increased, even in Europe, which we're already miles ahead of everybody else, and it's increasing in Asia as well. The, the Asian cities, Hong Kong and Singapore, have still got remarkable bus systems, but they've also got extraordinary metro systems which are, which are expanding. But the, um, the Australian cities actually declined. We have, not, we have not been building enough good quality public transport to keep up with our population growth. Just, just to step back a little bit and to, 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 to just look at what a famous historian um, who has, has passed on, unfortunately, Tony Judd, um, a British historian, said uh, in the last years of his life, uh, one of the journalists from the, 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 um, uh, the New Yorker uh, discovered that um, this very famous historian spent um, the last very painful part of his life writing, of all things, about trains. And uh, this is a guy that had, you know, studied the history of Europe over hundreds of years. And he said, for any trip under 10 miles or between 150 and 500 miles in any country with a functioning railway network, a train is the quickest way to travel, as well as taking all costs into account the cheapest and least destructive. The attractions of a, of a return to the social calculation are becoming as clear to modern planners as they once were for rather different reasons to our Victorian predecessors. What was for a while old-fashioned has once, it came, once again become very modern. And what we see is, again, um, in, in the trends, the public transport service is going up. Um, this is the seat kilometres. This is a way of measuring the level of public transport service, the seat kilometres per capita. You can see in London and Bern and Helsinki and Hong Kong these extraordinary levels of public transport service per capita. The Canadian cities, the best is Toronto, they cut in down here. Calgary, Ottawa, Vancouver, Montreal. So not really 
great performers in terms of the level of service that is provided, but very good performers in terms of the amount of usage that is made of that service that is available. Public transport seat kilometres have been increasing. All the regions have shown increases in that factor, so that is a good thing. And that has been followed um, by increases in public transport usage. This is the number of boardings per capita per year, and you can see Prague has got 1,050 public transport boardings per person per year. So that is, that is three, basically three public transport trips for every man, woman and child every day. And it goes down to Phoenix with 17. <laughs> so there's this massive, massive range. The American cities are by and large, and the Australian cities are by and large down here in this area, but the Canadian cities range between about 129 and 206 public transport trips per capita. So this is not a bad performance. When you consider how, how the public transport service looked, these cities are utilising public transport quite well. Vancouver's got 134 trips per capita per annum. You know, Los Angeles and Perth's got less than half that, 68 public transport trips per capita per annum. I think Vancouver is going to overtake Toronto in terms of public transport use. Remains to be seen, I've got to get the data. One way to um, increase your use of public transport, of course, is through building around your public transport system and you've got some good examples here um, in the Vancouver region. You have the advantage in the city of Vancouver that you don't have any freeways, so the public transport system, the rail system, is the best way, quickest way to get around. Um, New Westminster, um, it's a favourite place of mine. I always go back there and walk along this, uh, this very att attractive boulevard. And uh, when I first showed these pictures from 1987 to planners in Perth, they said, oh, yes, look at it now. But, you know, in 20 years it's going to be a slum. Well, I don't see any evidence of that. So I think it's beautiful. Um, Public transport use um, is a good story as well. It's not dramatic in, by 2006, but all the regions are going up in terms of public transport use. Where's the usage occurring? Where's it going up the most? In the rail systems. It's the rail systems that are be having the biggest increase in public transport use. Vancouver had a 14% increase over that decade. Buses went up 5%, the rail went up 49%. Of course, it's very important to invest in the buses as well because the buses in Vancouver are, are a very, very important part of the public transport system. But you can see the Canadian cities here with 150 public transport trips per capita are way ahead of their Australian uh, neighbours or cousins and, and, and way, way, way in excess of what any, anything in America. So at the moment in the world, there is what you could call a new golden age of rail um, occurring. 82 Chinese cities are building metro systems and nationally there's a huge um, high-speed rail network. 51 Indian cities are building metros at the moment. This is, this is incredible. This is a huge change. Middle Eastern cities, Riyadh, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Doha, they're all planning or building um, metro and light rail. The European cities continue to, to, to expand their rail network. Paris has got this beautiful um, circumferential light rail system that operates on a grass track bed. You can see pictures here. You can, this is from the Middle East. And Perth has done some amazing things with rail. This is, this is a graph of Adelaide, the blue line. That's their rail usage from 1988 to 2014. And this is Perth. This is Perth's rail usage between 1988 and 2014. It's increased sevenfold. Why has it done that? Because we've invested in it, we've built longer lines, we've, we've, we've actually started to get some transit-oriented development and it is, it, it is really, really a success story. And it, and it shows that even in a low-density city like Perth, you can make rail work. Perth is 10, 11 persons per hectare, Vancouver is 25 per hectare. So if we can make rail work, at 11 persons per hectare, you can make it work at 25 and 
if you expand the system. Um, one of the reasons why rail has been going extremely well is because the speed relative to cars has been going up. So in 1960, rail was only 0.88 as fast as cars, 1.05 faster, 1.07, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13. So it's, it's, it's gaining in its relative speed, and that is also affecting the overall public transport speed compared to cars. So it's gone from 0.55 to 0.7 over that time. So that is pretty important. And to just stress the importance of the comparative speed between cars and rail, I've looked at each of the, the lines, the, the, um, the five lines in Perth. This is the average speed of the line, and this is the annual boardings per line. And you can see that the Joondalup line, the, one of the new lines, and the Mandurah line, the very high speed, very high average speed, have got by far uh, the greatest utilisation, but the fewest stations. So there's no correlation between the number of stations. The correlation is between the speed of the line and whether it competes with the car. So it's a it's a very good idea to 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 think about building rail systems, particularly in. Um, the, uh, the very congested and heavily motorising cities. And again, just, just to sort of um, put a little bit of a, a sort of philosophical bent on this, this is again from this British historian, Tony Judd, and he says, the railways were and remain the necessary and natural accompaniment to the emergence of civil society. They are a collective project for individual benefit. They cannot exist without common accord and in recent times, common expenditure. And by design, they offer a practical benefit to individual and collectivity alike. This is something the market cannot accomplish except on its own account of itself by happy inadvertence. So this is, a, this is a, a guy that had this incredible breadth of historical thinking who spends his, his last days on earth expounding the benefits of all things um, railway systems. And... Where are we going in the next one? OK. And this is, um, this is the... How much of travel, how much of our motorised travel is by public transport? Of all the movement that we do, how, what percentage is by public transport? Well, if you're in an American city, it's around 3%. You know, Phoenix, 0.7% of all the movement in the city is by public transport. If you live in Hong Kong, 84% of all mobility is by public transport. So there's a massive difference. The American cities are all down here, along with most of the Australian ones. But you see how the Canadian cities cut in and range between about 8.5% and 15%. Now, that's, it's not fantastic, but it's certainly better than Australia and America, and it gets into uh, some of the European area as well. And that has been going up. It's not going backwards, it's going in a decent direction. So we, we are, if you like, at least in these cities, improving and not uh, declining in this area. And the final um, piece of data um, is the non-motorised transport. So um, walking and cycling. How much of our daily travel is by walking and cycling? And here we see that in Zurich, it's 52% of daily trips by walking and cycling. Frankfurt, 43%. Geneva, 41%. So the Euro some of the European cities have got an extraordinary amount of daily travel by foot and bike. The American cities struggle to get 3 or 4% of daily travel by walking and cycling. Does anybody know what the average daily distance that an American walks? You want to have a guess? How many? How, how far does an average American walk per day, nationally? Three hundred meters. <laughs> In the Canadian cities, the level of walking and cycling is not great. I think that that is really a focus area that could really be improved, given the densities that you've got. So, you know, Toronto, according to the 
the travel survey, they got 6% of daily trips by walking and cycling. Ottawa, 12%. Montreal, 12 or nearly 13 Vancouver, nearly 13 Calgary, 14%. So Calgary actually does quite well, according to the travel surveys, in walking and cycling. And walking and cycling is also, apart from in Australia, on an upward trajectory. The American cities, as bad as they are, are actually increasing um, in, in the level of walking and cycling. Canadian cities are also going up. The European cities, very good and still increasing, and the two Asian cities also going up. So it's really, really important to, 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 to try to create situations where people are comfortable to walk or ride a bike, they can get the jobs done that they need to, they, they can enjoy themselves, they can feel safe, they can experience beauty. You can see it in the centres of cities like, like, like Barcelona and uh, in parts of Paris. And you can see it in sub-centres like in Munich. This is a sub-centre in um, about five or six kilometres from the city centre of Munich and you look down on it, where are the roads? Where are the car parks? There's none. It's all, it's all pedestrian and, and, pub and, and U-Bahn, metro-based. The roads are around the periphery and there is parking underground, but very much reduced. So these are the kinds of environments that help to support walking and cycling, of course, traffic calming. Germany, German cities are very good at accommodating cars, but not allowing the cars to dominate in the urban fabric. So they're comfortable for pedestrians and cyclists. Some of you may know that area in Montreal. I was really impressed to see an actual small neighbourhood pedestrianisation scheme in the, in the suburbs, it's not in the central city. So again, that, that really encourages things. So the last, the last tiny little bit of data just to sum this up. Um, in the book, we talk about um, automobile dependence being overcome when 75% region-wide of total travel is or, or less is by car. So if you get down to 75% of daily travel, which is about where Stuttgart, Hamburg are cutting into the graph, this red line is the 75% mark, below that, the cities at this end are not so automobile dependent. So the green part of the graph is the public transport component of total movement. The purple part is the foot. The blue part is the bike. So let's look at Copenhagen. Copenhagen is really renowned as a bicycle environment. But what proportion of the daily movement in the region is by car? It's 72%. Is Copenhagen dependent on the car? No, it's not. There are many options. You can live in Copenhagen and not experience so much car use. But it's very hard for walking and cycling to contribute a lot of the distance because the, shorts, the trips are so short. So what we're, what we're talking about here is overall, if you can get it down to about 75%, you've, you've really um, become uh, not automobile dependent. In the transit city fabric areas within your city, it should be 50% or less. And in the walking city components, the car shouldn't be contributing notionally more than about 25% of the movement. So that's, they're just some, some numbers to try to um, picture this a little more clearly. So what can we say? In summary, we can say that sustainable transport in cities is a package deal. Lower car use cities have less car ownership, they have more competitive public transport, more public transport use, more walking and cycling, less parking, higher density housing, fewer freeways, more high quality transit lines, lower energy use, lower emissions, but it's not linked to wealth. You can have all those things and still be wealthy. You don't have to be poor to, you know, it's not, it's not that the city has to be um, uh, lacking in, uh, in, in wealth. So some of the things that cities need to do to move beyond automobile dependence obviously revolve around minimising new auto, auto city fabric and perhaps reforming some of it 
and maximising the transit and walking city fabric. So increasing density strategically around transit stops, building more quality transit infrastructure, improving urban centres and enhancing public spaces, stop building destructive freeways and even take out some of them in selected areas, introduce vehicle and bike sharing and car on demand schemes to help reduce car ownership. That could include electric cars and e-bikes. And use of integrated mobility management systems. People increasingly need this very good uh, access to information. So if they want to make a trip, they can instantly see, yes, I can walk to there, I can get a, a bike sharing, and then I can get to the metro station, travel there, and then I can pick up another bike there, and I'm at my destination. All of that is very important. And we have to bite the bullet with congestion charging. You know, this is a ridiculous situation that we have where cars are just given free run of the roads. It is, it is morally untenable to, to continue to not charge uh, a proper price to reflect the true costs of the automobile in our society. Public transport users are doing society a great service, which is unacknowledged and unaccounted for in the, the way that um, accounting is done. And finally, we, could, we can actually see that this move towards sustainable cities and more public transport, more walking and cycling, could be part of a new era of sustainability. We, we know that through history we've had these waves, they're called long wave business cycles or Kondratiev waves, and they follow a, a, a sort of cyclical thing. There's recession, depression, revival and prosperity. So if you go back through history, we have the, the Iron Age, the your water and power, mechanisation, textiles, commerce, steam power, electricities and chemicals, the internal combustion engine, petrochemicals, electronics, aviation, digital networks, biotechnology, software information, that's kind of the age that we're in at the moment. And people are saying that the, the, the recession that, that we're, we've had or are having is the, the harbinger of, of a new long wave business cycle which will be based on, on things green, if you like. Um, and all of the things I've been talking about are part of that. And just to end off, just to bring us to a, maybe a, a slightly philosophical note, Again, um, this journalist, Ab Adam Gopnik, who w writes for The New Yorker, um, wrote an article recently in May this year called The Plot Against Trains. He's the one who discovered Tony Jutt's work on, on rail systems. And he ended his article, I thought, with a very nice thing. He said, Tri trains take us places together. Every time you ride one, you look outside and you look inside. And you can't help but think about the private and the public in a new way. A train is a small society, headed somewhere, more or less on time, more or less together, more or less sharing the same window with a common view and a singular destination. I just thought that was a kind of a, a nice reflection on what I've been talking about. Thank you. <laughs>